going to just, before I get started here, give folks a minute to get into the session. I can see our attendee list going up. I know everyone was waiting to get started here, so I'll begin in just a minute once everyone has a chance to get into the webinar. So if you're in already, hopefully you can hear me and see our shared screen here, and we'll be starting the presentation in just another minute. Okay, so welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ashley Soa. I'm a user services librarian for McGraw-Hill and I'll be facilitating this webinar today with our special guests who I will introduce momentarily. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started with the presentation. The webinar is being recorded so everyone who registered will receive a link to that recording within two days after the webinar. All of your attendee lines are muted, but you do have the option to use the chat or Q&A to communicate. Please use the Q&A box for any official questions that you'd like me to pass along to our presenters, and then feel free to use the chat box to add any other comments that you'd like to share with us or with your fellow attendees. We definitely do want to hear from you and for this to be as interactive as possible, so please do, do use those options. And before I introduce our speakers today, I just want to have a quick slide on Access Engineering, the Access Engineering platform, which is home to the new case studies, which we will be discussing today. And Access Engineering is also home to over 700 engineering books across all engineering disciplines, as well as interactive tools and features, including instructional videos, spreadsheet calculators, and much, much more. If you are interested in learning more about Access Engineering or have questions on available content on the site, I have the user services email address on the slide there, and we are happy to answer any questions that you have. Also, feel free to use the Q&A for any questions, and I can follow up with you with more details after the webinar as well. And now I am thrilled to introduce our guest speakers, Dr. Sarah Rooney, Dr. Lori Hertz, and Dr. Katie Ruther. Dr. Sarah I. Rooney is an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Delaware. She teaches courses in engineering design, biomechanics, clinical immersion, and a technical elective on applying engineering to exercise. As the Director of Undergraduate Studies, Dr. Rooney oversees the department's undergraduate curriculum and ABET accreditation process. She applies evidence-based and inclusive teaching strategies in the classroom and across the curriculum. Dr. Lori Hertz, is a professor of practice in the associate chair of the bioengineering department at Lehigh University. She teaches courses in metabolic engineering, quantitative biology, and regulatory affairs. In her role of associate chair, she oversees the operations of the undergraduate program, curriculum development, and ABET accreditation. Prior to joining the Lehigh faculty, she worked in the pharmaceutical industry where she held several positions in the process development and technology transfer of pharmaceutical products. Dr. Katie Ruther is a senior lecturer in design, innovation, and entrepreneurship in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Columbia University with additional appointments as the director of, Columbia's, of the Columbia Biomedical Engineering Accelerator Biomedex program and the Director of Master's Studies. She teaches courses in design, innovation, and entrepreneurship in medicine and biomechanics, and has advised numerous student and faculty teams and startups in developing and commercializing medical technologies. Thank you so much to all of our presenters for being with us today. A quick agenda for our presentation. We'll start with discussing why using a case study is beneficial in BME courses, then describe what a case study is and how our access engineering case studies are structured. And we'll finish up with how to use BME case studies in remote courses with plenty of time for questions for our speakers and discussion of best practices as well. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Rooney to start us off. Great, thank you. 
So I thought I would kick us off with a bit of a poll um, because this kind of lays the foundation for why we choose to use these case studies. Um, so if Ashley, if you want to queue up the poll for us, I'm curious uh, of all of you, which of these common issues do you face in your classes? Um, a, providing BME specific applications when you're using a general engineering textbook. Uh, B, providing BME applications beyond your area of expertise. C, engaging students in active learning. D, tailoring your activities to different levels of learning. So trying to tailor to first years versus upper level undergraduates versus graduate students. E, integrating fundamental engineering concepts with other topics, such as regulatory commercialization, business strategy, or ethics, or F, mapping your course activities to ABET accreditation student outcomes. And you can select multiple answers, everything, all of these challenges that you think you face. Oh, okay, now I'm seeing results come in. I think there was an issue with the poll, but now I am seeing results. Can the panelists see that as well? Yep, just popped up for me. I don't Perfect. see results though yet. Okay, I can read them off. So we have, it looks like just over, or just under half of our attendees have voted. So we're seeing 76% said engaging students in active learning. Um, that just went up to 78 We've got next highest is 44, or next highest we have 50 for providing BME specific applications when using a general engineering textbook, then close at 44% providing BME applications beyond my area of expertise, and around tied, around 30% are the last three D, E, and F choices there. Great, thanks Ashley. So, um, this is how I approached case studies and why I, um, got involved in this project to begin with. These are all the challenges that I faced in my own teaching. So just to give an example, um, one of the courses that I teach is our junior level biomechanics course. And I know each biomedical engineering program um, typically has a biomechanics course, but might structure it in one of two ways. Some courses are, or some programs choose to use a traditional mechanical engineering, statics and mechanics of materials course first, and then a subsequent biomechanics course, whereas other programs choose to do all of that in one course. And that's how we approach it at the University of Delaware. So my intro course is a combination of traditional statics and mechanics of materials, but with the application of uh, biologic scenarios. So um, in my specific course, I use a very traditional and mechanics textbook which means it's up to me as the instructor to come up with all of the applications, which can be really challenging and it can take a lot of time. Beyond that, my expertise specifically is in orthopedics, um, but biomechanics is a broad field that obviously applies beyond orthopedics in the musculoskeletal system, and I want my students to recognize that. So that's another challenge that I've had to face. Um, I use a lot of active learning in my classes, but as we all know, it takes a lot of time to prepare those activities. I also struggle sometimes. I have to create separate assignments for the honor students in my courses, um, which means that I need to tailor different activities to different levels of student learning. It can also be challenging to figure out how to implement these really foundational engineering concepts with other topics that are equally important but have a different flair, such as regulatory and ethics. Um, and make them align with my course content so it doesn't just seem like I'm slipping in a, modu a module that really has no application to what the students are learning in class. And it can be challenging to find high quality examples that directly align with content. And like all of you, um, I'm time constrained and especially time constrained in um, dealing with the pandemic that's going on. And that's what led to my involvement in these case studies was trying to address all of these issues that I uh, face in my own teaching. So I'll pass the torch on over to uh, Dr. Hertz who will talk about what a case study is. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Ashley, for the introduction. So let's get into the basics of what we mean by a case study. We can define a case study as an educational tool. It provides in-depth study on a on course topics using a real world example. 
And oftentimes we use case studies as a form of active learning to engage students. And it centers on the case and students learn by discussing and doing. There are currently four case studies on McGraw-Hill's Access Engineering page. The first is atrial fibrillation, improving therapy via engineering advancements. The second is continuous blood pressure monitoring, addressing unmet clinical needs. The third is authored by Katie and Sarah, rotator cuff repair, bridging, bridging the gap through engineering innovation. And the fourth is authored by myself, development and manufacture of a cell culture process for a phase one biopharmaceutical product. Now let's go over the typical structure of the case studies. Begins with an abstract, which is a very short overview of what the case study is. And that is followed by the introduction. It includes background information on the topic of the case study, as well as a mission statement or hook. And the hook is what will engage the students and capture their interest. The next part includes the learning objectives. These are learning objectives for students, what, their, what the expectations are for them. And the learning objectives also link to the ABED outcomes. So as Sarah had mentioned during her portion of the presentation, one of the challenges of a BME curriculum is linking the courses and the topics to the outcomes that are defined by ABED. Then the meat of the case study is the main body. This is the content and it's organized by what we call themes. Also, the main body provides the content that is needed to answer the questions and solve the problems that are given to the students. So let's look at the main themes. All of the case studies have technical concepts as well as clinical concepts. So all engineering courses cover technical concepts. Then in the BME case studies, examples of technical concepts can include biomechanics, bioprocessing, instrumentation, physiology, and design. And this is to name just a few. What can separate the BME topics from say other fields of engineering are the clinical topics or the clinical concepts because BME relates strongly to the healthcare industry. The main body may also capture other aspects of BME problems. So this can include FDA regulations and engineering standards, ethics, business principles and reimbursement. Some examples of this are market analysis, value proposition, organizational structure and leadership. And the last theme includes collaborative and communication skills. And this is applicable for all engineers. The next part of the case studies includes the questions and problems that are assigned to the students. These are grouped by the theme. So as we look through the example I'm going to present, you'll see how the questions relate to each of the themes. And the questions are also related back to the learning objectives. And lastly, you'll see the instructor resources. These are the solutions to the questions and problems. These are supplied to you, the course instructors. And also the resources will include how to use the case study and what the applicable courses are in which the case studies can be used. We like to call these case studies a choose your own adventure. And I think Sarah had coined that frame, phrase, so we'll credit her for that. The instructors can include the section of the main body and the questions based on the following. The course or courses in which the case study is being used. For example, what is used in a biomechanics course is going to be different than what is used in an FDA regulations course. The instructors can also include sections based on the level of the students. Some questions are geared more towards first or second year students, whereas others are geared more towards juniors and seniors. And also the instructors can include the sections based on the topics they wish to cover. So now let's take a look at the case study on the development and manufacture of a cell culture process. So let me go to the access engineering page, which you can see here. Let me just back up one step. 
here's the main page on access engineering for all four of the case studies. So you can see each one here. I'm going to go ahead and click on this one. I'll show you some of the features here first. We start with the abstract. So we're in the tab for the case study, followed by the introduction with links to all the references. And then I do want to point out on the right hand side, you can see related subjects, as well as the learning objectives. But now I'm just going to flip over to my next file, which will show some of the details of the case study. Okay. So here you can see the abstract. The next portion is the introduction. And as you can see here, this includes background information about the overall subject, which is biopharmaceuticals, and then information about a more specific topic, which is monoclonal antibodies. Here you can see the hook. This basically, the students are given the role of recent college graduates working as a bioprocess engineer at a fictitious company. So this is the hook that grabs the student's interest. And then there's a bit of information. Um, this is the background knowledge that the students should have. So students here should have at least introductory cell level or introductory level background in cell biology, chemistry, or math. Next are the learning objectives. So these are related to the themes. I've addressed three of the half dozen or so different themes, technical concepts, clinical concepts, and regulatory affairs. And these are then mapped to specific ABET outcomes. Then we get to the main body. And this is also organized by the themes. So there are numerous um, sub-themes under technical concepts. Those are listed here. And then as I scroll down, you can see more of the technical concepts. Then clinical concepts, regulatory affairs, and so forth. So this just gives you a sense of the layout as well as the content. So as part of the resources, there is an instructor guide, and this relates to the choose your own adventure, where the instructors can pick their content and they can also pick the mode of delivery. And Katie's going to talk about this a bit more, so I won't um, give too many details about that, but then you can see what courses this is applicable for. So this is mostly for students in bioengineering or biomedical engineering, and you can see that by the names of the topics, but it could also be applicable for a course in FDA regulations. You could just pull out the content of that. Or if you're teaching a chemical engineering course, such as kinetics and reactor design, but you want to introduce some bioprocessing applications, you could also use it in that type of a course. And the last part I wanted to show you was the problems and solutions. So of course the students would only have the problems that you give them, but then in the instructor guide, you'd have access to the solutions. So here the hook is repeated. Again, the students are hypothetical recent college graduates who are working at a biotech startup. And again, the problems are organized by themes and sub-themes. And the way they're presented in the resources for instructors, you have the problems followed by the solutions. And again, I just wanted to walk you through a case study to show what the overall content looks like. Now let me go back to the presentation.
we have new cases that are coming soon. Those are shown here. One is on the biotransport of cannabis and engineering a solution. The second is modeling the 2020 model coronavirus pandemic. And then the third is the biomaterial scaffold for the prevention of trauma-induced heterotopic ossification. I'm actually one of the authors of the COVID case study. I'm co-authoring that with Brian Zurakowski, who's at the University of Delaware. And this case study covers epidemiological models to study disease spread in a population. We're looking at a type of model called the SIR model, where there are three populations. So it's SIR. The three populations are susceptible, infectious, and removed. And this describes how the different populations change with time as a pandemic progresses. And we're using MATLAB to solve differential equations. And then the other major component is to look at real COVID data from publicly available information. So with that, I will pass the baton to Katie and she'll talk about how to use case studies. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, so uh, like Sarah and Lori, I guess the, the, my rationale for getting involved in this was a little bit different. It was actually through um, my business training and getting an MBA. And for those of you that are familiar with business education, case studies are really the, one of the primary modes of teaching and learning um, for the MBA. And I realized that it's actually a pretty useful way of learning and teaching. And I thought it could be effective for engineering, the engineering classroom. Um, so a couple comments on that. I think historically case studies are portrayed as instructor centered where instructors kind of lead through the discussion and do cold calling among the students to make sure that they read the case. Um, but ideally here we have more of a shift towards a learner centered um, experience where the students are really engaged in the analysis and the teaching and the interpretation and discussion of the cases. They're also really effective for both asynchronous and synchronous learning. So I'll talk about examples of that. Um, and as Lori uh, represented, it's really varying levels. Undergrads and grad students can both engage in, in these cases and you could make them more difficult or less difficult depending on the level of students as well as their prerequisite knowledge. So you'll see in each of the case studies what the authors felt like with the prerequisite knowledge that was necessary. Next slide. So thinking about how to use case studies asynchronously. So a lot of us, um, as we embark in this fall semester and thinking about remote opportunities as well as asynchronous opportunities for our students, um, the first thing that comes to mind, obviously, is actually the reading of the case. So that'll be an asynchronous activity. They also could perhaps respond to quiz questions associated with the case just to demonstrate that they read it, or perhaps taking some of the more simple questions that are in the problem sets that are in the case studies, you can use those as quiz, quiz questions. You can also um, include discussion questions the students can post on the learning management system, and they can engage and respond to one another asynchronously. And then finally, of course, these problem sets and assignments that have been curated for each of these case studies. Some of these are very technical, so they're actually math and problem solving, and then some of, the little, some of them a little bit more oriented towards business or other aspects um, that might be relevant for our biomedical engineering students to be familiar with. In terms of how to use the case studies synchronously, um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with case studies, I would actually, you know, really search the internet. There's a lot of resources and evidence around how to use case studies. And some of these examples I've actually taken from the Columbia University Center for Teaching and Learning. And so they gave some examples of how we might use case studies. And I think they're all relevant here. So the first is, of course, discussion. This is probably the most common way case studies are used for MBA students. And I think it's also relevant for our engineering students. These really can be the vehicles for classroom discussion and this opportunity for active learning. Ideally, you want to model how you will analyze your case and interpret and discuss the case. And then perhaps you can assign roles to the students. You can use breakout rooms in Zoom. Um, one person can be leading the discussion. Somebody can be facilitating and listening actively and kind of contributing and following up on any of the discussion that's occurring. Maybe you have a guide of discussion questions that they're following along. Maybe somebody who's a recorder, they'll take notes and perhaps report back to the group after these breakout discussions. And then again, this would be 
um, summarizing those main points. So that could be somebody who's assigned to be the discussion wrapper. So breakout rooms and discussion, I think that could be a nice way to do this synchronously and, and make an active learning experience for the students. Another option is for the instructors to sort of present on the case. It could be a shorter period of time here. Um, we could use this case to kind of introduce our students to different topics. So for our case that we did on rotator cuff repair, we have elements related to design. We have uh, elements related to biomechanics. We have elements related to business and regulatory and reimbursement. And so perhaps we want to use the case to introduce these topic areas. And you can punctuate that discussion with different poll questions so that the students students are actively engaged in that discussion. Um, another option is what they're calling a jigsaw. So this is possible that we can really assign student groups to pieces of the case. Depending on which case you worked on, it, it may be possible or it might not. Um, but as a quick example, for our rotator cuff repair case, I mentioned we had um, topics on regulatory as well as reimbursement and the students are supposed to investigate the regulatory pathway for a new rotator cuff medical device and as well as investigate the reimbursement codes or insurance um, reimbursement for um, a rotator cuff medical device. And so perhaps you can break out and the students will then teach one another, they'll investigate during the class class, they'll try to identify the regulatory pathway or and reimbursement codes, and then they'll come back to the class and teach that material to their peers. And then finally, so we have this portfolio now of six cases with more coming, perhaps you would assign individual groups, individual cases, and then the students can come back and present to the class um, their analysis or, you know, their designs or whatever kind of outcomes are associated with each of the cases um, and have that experience to teach their peers aspects of things that they learn, um, as well as their own interpretation of things. So I think that leaves us um, now with an, an additional time for q and I know there are questions coming in in the chat. Um, we're happy to stick around and address any questions you might have. And, and Lori and Sarah and I will be here to address those questions. Okay, uh, this is Ashley jumping back on again. There were a few questions about um, getting to the resources and getting to those instructor resources that we mentioned. So, um, so let me just share my screen quickly to get into that while some of the um, other questions filter in. I know there was one that Lauren had wanted to answer as well. So let me share my screen here. And here we are on the Access Engineering site again. This is just the homepage that you'll get to if you open up the site. Um, again, Access Engineering does require an institutional subscription. So if you have questions on whether your school hasn't subscription or not, um, feel free to reach out to user services. Again, we're happy to check for that. And then once you're on the homepage, there should be a case studies button right here in the middle. And if you click on that, it will bring up all of those four case studies so that you can look through them, read through all of those right from here. So that's the easiest way to get to these specific resources. And then if you're in the site, if you've done a search or you're in a different piece of content, you can just expand this browse menu and there's that same button again for the case studies. And then just speaking quickly to those instructor resources, I'm going back into a case study. So any content that you're on that has this resources tab, if you just go to that tab, you'll see the steps here for getting access to those resources. So first step is to register for a free personal account with Access Engineering. So that's just required, um, not for all the content on the site, but for these instructor resources. And then the next step, once you're in your personal account, which I'm not logged in here, but once you've logged in, you'll have the option to fill out a form on this page to request instructor rights that gets sent to user services. We verify that you're an instructor and then turn that on. The nice thing about that is once we turn it on, it's site-wide. So if you request it for one particular case study, you can come get the resources for all the other case studies for any textbooks on the site. It's just turned on site-wide and it is sort of locked so that you can feel confident that students are not you know coming in and having access to all of those um, resources as well they are specifically just to instructors and we do verify you as well so I'll stop my share there and let me see if there were any other questions 
So I saw the one question that came in of asking kind of how our case studies are being developed and um, that obviously the COVID case is very topical now. Um, so we actually have a biomedical engineering faculty advisory board of which you are currently hearing from three of the, the members of that advisory board and there, there are two other members on it as well. Um, and so we rely heavily on them to kind of guide us as to you know, what they think would be interesting and, and topical. Um, and so we we talked in you know in the spring April May and um, about you know which cases we wanted to work on next and obviously COVID came up very quickly in that um, and you know we actually did quite a bit of debating on what about COVID you know should we do and should it be a device or a ventilator or, you know or what it should be and you know we kind of decided we didn't have anything in the the data modeling side of things yet and that that was an area that you know would stay relevant for quite a while um, you know as most of what was going on with COVID was and still is very much a moving target. Um, you know, that was something that, you know, we could pick data from a particular point in time and it would, you know, it would stay valid um, for the case. So, um, but, you know, we're also, if, you know, happy to, you can feel free to email Ashley with any other suggestions or ideas that you have for cases, you know, um, we're always looking at for case study authors and, and ideas and all of that as well as we, you know, we've just started building up this library. And I don't know if Lori, Katie, or Sarah, if you have anything to add to that, feel free. <laughs> right, I guess those of us who are members of the advisory board actually have a pretty diverse set of backgrounds. So those of us who have written or co-authored case studies, like we've really brought our background and experience into it. And as many of you know, those of us who are on bioengineering and biomedical engineering faculty, we all have different academic backgrounds. and. Sometimes we teach courses that we're very familiar with, but sometimes we kind of learn things on the fly. So one nice thing about the case studies is it will really increase the breadth of material that is available to course instructors in BME. And I'll just add, you know, we're definitely interested in, you know, finding our case study so if you just, um, Ashley had up the user services email before, and I'm sure she'll put it up again, but if you just send a note there. Um, Robin, who's also kind of hidden right now on the webinar panel, um, will get in touch with you in terms of, you know, topic ideas and, and you know, start that conversation. And I just put the user services email in the chat again. So um, feel free to reach out there and we'll get you to the right place if you have questions about um, the case studies or would like to volunteer to, um, you know, start talking about other case study ideas or things that you'd like as well. So any other questions? I'm not seeing any unanswered ones um, right now. So please, while we have our great presenters here, if you have any questions about using these case studies in a class, if you have any um, just experiences that you want to share, I know you can't Unmute yourself because this is a webinar and talk, but feel free to type that in the chat or in the Q&A as well. I guess I can chime in with how I'm um, thinking of using a case study this fall in my course, in my biomechanics course that I introduced at the beginning. Um, so I'm planning on using components of the case study that Katie and I wrote together on rotator cuff. As Katie had mentioned, it, it has a lot of different facets associated with it. Um, talking about regulatory, reimbursement, commercialization components, design, and in addition to that, also biomechanics problems that we developed and wrote solutions for. Um, my course is going to be taught all um, asynchronously. So my plan right now and is to, since I already have group projects and I'm not as interested in specifically forming teams for this application, I'm planning on assigning components of it as um, homework problems. Um, if you were to look at that case study, you'll also notice that each one of the mechanics problems has several sub problems associated with it that kind of increase in their level of application. So for my class, which is an introduction to statics and mechanics of materials, I'm planning to use two of the questions, one that's um, basically modeling uh, the stress strain diagrams as well as a question that's uh, statics of the static analysis of the shoulder 
Um, so just kind of the preliminary intro questions for each of those two mechanics applications in my course. And I think that that's an example that's probably very different from how Katie might approach it in the courses that she teaches. Yeah, and I'll just follow up with Sarah on that. Just so as an example, I'm teaching a graduate level biomechanics course. And while a lot of the technical and foundational biomechanics aspects are important, our emphasis is really going to be a little bit more on some of the industry type applications for these students who are looking for industry jobs and might already have this core foundation in biomechanics um, and are now looking for more of the application aspects. So a lot of around the design, designing new medical devices for these applications, as well as some of the commercialization classes questions. Okay, any other questions for the panelists today? Give everyone a minute or if anyone has anything else they want to share that we haven't talked about yet. Or Lauren or Robin, if you want to jump in with anything. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope everyone found this really useful. I definitely did, learning more about these case studies that are, again, brand new on access engineering. Um, hopefully, everyone is able to find uses for them in their classes. Um, we'd love to hear if you have ideas for new case studies. If you have interesting uses that you're using these in your classes, please feel free, again, to keep in contact to reach out to us. The user services email is there. That's a great way to reach us. And thank you again for attending today. I'll stick on the line for a little bit more in case anyone has any last minute questions, but I'll let everyone go now and thank you again. Okay, I'm seeing some messages of thanks, but no additional questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and end it now for everyone. So again, thank you so much and we'll follow up um, after this as well. Thank you. Bye guys, thanks.